Good morning, and welcome to our next International Thyroid Tumor Board. Uh, I'm, I'm Mike Tuttle from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, one of the endocrinologists that's helping organize this this morning. Uh, this morning, we'll go to the next slide. Our tumor board this morning, um, I feel like I'm doing a commercial, is being brought to us by MD Anderson. So over the, uh, over the ways we do these tumor boards, we've wanted to give um, various centers around the world the opportunity to share with us sort of how their tumor board works and cases that they interact. So you can see how these teams work together. Um, we're very pleased this morning to have uh, this group of uh, really phenomenal thyroid cancer experts. So let's just go around the corner, start up with Dr. Besaidi and have you guys introduce yourself just one or two sentences so we know who we're dealing with. Hi, uh, everyone. Thank you for joining us early morning today. My name is Naifa Bosaidi, and I'm one of the oncologic endocrinologists here that um, lives, breathes, and loves uh, trying to find the cure for thyroid cancer. Maria? Hi, Maria Cavadinas. I'm also an oncologic endocrinologist at MD Anderson. Ramona? Good morning, everyone. I'm Ramona Dadu. I'm an oncologic endocrinologist at MD Anderson as well. Okay, Jennifer? Good morning, I'm Jennifer Wong. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, I am one of the head and neck surgeons at MD Anderson with a special interest in uh, thyroid cancers. Awesome. So just before I turn it over to Dr. Zafario to introduce himself and take over, um, we're going to encourage you to put questions in the comments or the chats. Um, we're going to do it a little differently this morning. Mark's going to run the actual presentation of the cases, and I'm going to be watching the questions and comments. So if there are questions and comments that come through, let them know, and I'll bring those to the panelists' attentions. Uh, Mark, I'll let you introduce yourself and do the disclosures, and let's get started. Okay. Well, thank you to uh, Dr. Erkin and Dr. Tuttle for bringing us here today for the invitation. We're excited to be here. I'm a head and neck surgeon at MD Anderson and excited to uh, present these cases to our uh, panel of endocrine oncologists and uh, surgeons here. And uh, Look forward to also some questions and commentary and uh, advice from the audience. So disclosures are listed here on this slide, um, and we'll just get started. So we're just gonna um, we're just gonna start by telling you this is a 59 year old um, otherwise healthy gentleman who presents with sporadic uh, medullary thyroid cancer. He has a calcitonin of of over uh, 1300, a CEA of over 300. His left buccal cord is paralyzed and um, he has some sub-centimeter lung and liver nodules and, uh, and bone lesions. So we have uh, uh, CT imaging. Uh, Dr. Wong, can you go through, um, these are just uh, uh, obviously just some um, select CT images here, axial um, CT images with contrast and one coronal. Uh, can you go through these real quick? Tell us what you see here. Yeah, so uh, we'll start uh, on the first image here on the upper corner here. So the the disease, uh, so this is an axial cut of the CT with contrast and we're at the level of the clavicles. Um, the black here is the airway uh, of white is bone and uh, where the arrow is showing here uh, is disease in the right tracheoesophageal groove um, and um, uh, following the next slide, you can see that at a similar uh, a level that there is disease in the left tracheoesophageal groove as well. It's abutting the esophagus as well as the trachea, but uh, on this uh, uh, image, there does not appear to be invasion. Um, so uh, uh, we know that there's bilateral tr tracheoesophageal groove disease. The patient presents with a left vocal cord paralysis. So the left side uh, appears to be involving the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve. Uh, on the next image, uh, and fairly, uh, next two images, and fairly, we can uh, see that uh, on the coronal cut as well as the axial cuts, there's evidence of large uh, metastatic cervical lymphadenopathy. Uh, this appears to be compressing the jugular vein. Um, and um, I don't know if there's, uh, it does not appear on the coronal that there's other uh, additional uh, lateral neck disease. Great. Um, so, um... Dr. Busedi, what are some of the things that uh, uh, some of the first uh, questions you want to ask or first uh, tests you want to uh, consider for this patient, other than so, the CT, which we already have? 
So, yeah, thanks, Mark. So, you know, the first thing is when I'm with the patient is, um, right, we're explaining that this is medullary thyroid cancer and give them the diagnosis um, and that they have a fairly extensive disease. So when the calcitonin is that high, um, it was already done, but you do full body imaging. And I explained to the patient that they, you know, 80% of the time medullary thyroid cancer is sporadic and 20% of the time it's hereditary. Um, and that every medullary thyroid cancer patient needs to undergo germline testing um, to make sure they don't have the hereditary version of the disease. And um, I would, you know, the patient would have met with the surgeon like they just met with Dr. Wong, and we'd have a discussion, right, um, in terms of how easy or hard the, the, the surgery would be and explain that that's their best chance of getting rid of the disease and decreasing morbidity. Um, because 20% of the time it's hereditary, I would, uh, unless, you know, depending on the timing of the surgery, if I'm not going to get the RET germline testing ahead of time, I would check serum plasma metanephrines and um, uh, 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 PTH and calcium to make sure, right, because if they have hereditary disease, they can have MEN2, and we need to know that they don't have that because that changes surgery, surgical planning. Yeah, great. Um, so let's say um, that they, they have the germline testing and it's negative. Um, do you go ahead and um, do any additional um, genetic molecular testing at this time? And if so, how do you how do you go about doing that? So my first question is to the surgeon is, you know, how, e uh, how easy or hard surgery would be and or it, was there a potential airway problem? If this if this disease were to grow, because if you go back a slide, he had or you don't have to go back a slide, but he had small um, sub centimeter uh, nodules in his lung, uh, liver and bone. And given that calcitonin and CEA level, the likelihood that he has disease outside of the neck is extremely high and that these sub centimeter lesions are probably distant disease. And so when we have a case like this of um, in the presence of distant disease, we always raise the question, do we do neck surgery or not? And um, we have the discussion with the surgeon in terms of, um, and the patient in terms of how morbid the surgery would be. So if, for example, Dr. Wong told me, you know, she, she read this complicated CT with me or for me, <laughs> um, and, you know, the disease was quite involved. So if, she, if we were to have that conversation and surgery were going to be morbid, yes, then we would do somatic um, mutational testing or next generation sequencing usually in general. Mm -hmm. Um, from any one of the companies or your own institution that's available, we have our own at our institution. Um, and how do and you do it? I mean, what do you, um, what kind of a sample do you need from the patient to get that that type of testing? Oh, so um, we often can do this with a, uh, a core biopsy. Um, and so this patient would have been biopsied to make sure that they have medullary thyroid cancer, um, even though we knew it biochemically. And then from that tissue, the, the paraffin embedded tissue, we can, um, or if a patient had surgery, you can order this testing. Um, it takes, depending on where you are, anywhere from two um, about half of the time you'll end up getting a uh, somatic or on the tumor. Yeah, perfect. So yeah, that's a great point, Naifa. Um, you know, the germline testing that we do is a, is a blood test. Um, the um, the most common um, test um, uh, for uh, uh, for sporadic uh, uh, medullary thyroid cancer, um, the somatic test is uh, is actually a, a tissue test. Although there are some blood tests that can can be used in that regard too. Those are those are pretty experimental. So um, so this patient, as was mentioned, had a negative germline test. So the the the, the blood test for the germline mutation was negative, but then had um, uh, the tumor tissue that was biopsied, um, came back with a RET mutation, um, and that was a, um, the specific mutation is not mentioned here, but it's a C630R uh, mutation, um, and of course that's a sporadic mutation uh, in this particular case. Um, so um, what next? What are we, um, what are, what are we, uh, Jen, uh, what are your thoughts uh, with regard to, um, to, to surgery for this patient? Hey, and Jen, Jen while, while, while you're talking about the surgery, Jen, there was a question from the audience uh, about wondering whether or not you're concerned about the membrane part of the posterior trachea as you're sort of thinking about your procedure there. 
Uh, yeah, so um, so um, my approach for this would be obviously we would meet with the patient in a multidisciplinary fashion. Um, the patient would meet me uh, as well as uh, one of the oncologic uh, endocrinologists um, as uh, we kind of already went through the team approach with Dr. Versady here. Um, my th uh, so I would explain the findings of uh, the CT with the patient. Uh, basically uh, describing that the patient has advanced local regional disease and image. Uh, there is a disease on both tracheoesophageal grooves and um, I will want to confirm the uh, vocal cord paralysis uh, on um, a scope exam and um, uh, to answer the question of uh, uh, the audience about the membranous involvement. So uh, I, I would have other additional slices of this image uh, to go through. And um, from what I can see here, um, it does not appear to be involved. In, and I'm assuming um, and the, uh, the audience member can clarify if the, I'm not uh, on the right side, but on the left side, um, it appears that this disease is closely adherent to the trachea uh, as well as the esophagus. Um, so I do expect to have some stickiness there, but based on this high resolution uh, fine cut CT, I do not see actual invasion of the trachea because there will be evidence of uh, irregularity uh, inside the lumen of the trachea. So um, I do not see it here, uh, but that is a, a very important point to address with the uh, high resolution imaging. So uh, I would talk to the patient about the potential for contralateral uh, uh, nerve um, issues, uh, given that there is right tracheal esophageal groove. So the patient has uh, only one uh, functioning vocal cord, which is uh, important to acknowledge given uh, uh, potential complications related to that. Since the left side is already uh, not functioning preoperatively, um, there is a high chance that uh, uh, the patient uh, will require resection of a segment of the recurrent laryngeal nerve that's involved. In terms of the control, uh, in terms of the uh, cervical neck disease, um, who counsel the patient about requiring a left lateral neck dissection given the extent of uh, uh, the disease and the associated um, surgical considerations uh, about yeah, yeah, let me let me uh, interrupt you one second here. Yeah. So let's say the, let's say the ultrasound shows that the right lateral neck there's no disease there in the right lateral neck. You've got a calcitonin of thirteen hundred. Um, the ultrasound of the right lateral uh, neck disease is negative, um, high definition ultrasound. You don't see anything in the right lateral neck on the CT. What are the considerations um, in terms of how to approach the lateral neck? How how do we look at that in MD Anderson? And also, you know, what are the what are things that are considered, you know, at other institutions across the, the, the globe? Right, right. Okay. So um, in terms of um, considering performing a prophylactic, uh, prophylactic um, neck dissection in the instance that there's no um, evidence of disease on imaging. Um, there are, uh, that is an area of potential controversy in the literature. Um, some uh, some uh, institutions will rely on the CA calcitonin levels. Um, I would say that essentially MD Anderson would rely on AR, uh, very good radiologists, as well as uh, imaging with uh, CT neck, as well as ultrasound. In our practice, in my practice, generally speaking, if there is no evidence of contralateral uh, uh, lateral neck disease here on ultrasound and CT neck, we're okay to observe that closely. And obviously I will have a conversation with uh, my endocrinologist uh, colleague and make sure that they're on board with that plan. Yeah, that's a great point. I think, you know, the, just to acknowledge there is controversy in, in the guidelines on this. You know, the Germans have published a lot of data suggesting that once you start to see that calcitonin over 20, you start to see uh, unilateral lateral neck disease and over 200 uh, contralateral lateral neck disease. So there is some some centers that that look at you know at cutoff numbers like those in terms of calcitonin to uh, to do uh, elective neck dissections. But our practice, um, based on our experience and what we publish, has been um, only to base those surgeries on um, actual um, ultrasonographically and CT. Um, apparent disease in the lateral neck uh, rather than just calcitonin level. So 
what is the uh, initial best management for this patient? And just to just to clarify, you know, there's not a right or wrong answer here. Um, uh, let's go back to um, Naifa. Um, what would we? What are the considerations for this patient? So, um, you know, so we've heard, right, that this patient has metastatic medullary thyroid cancer and surgery will be fairly morbid and that we need to think about um, potentially um, we could, the options are the patient could go to the operating room and not worry about what the somatic testing does. Or if we would like to make this surgery easier, potentially we could use a drug in the neoadjuvant setting. So just to step back, when we talk about um, you know, initial management of these patients and we're deciding if the surgeon, normally these patients would just go straight for surgery, right? Or normally, I'm sorry, before our current standard of care, um, these patients go for surgery. But some of the things that are coming up um, in discussions are, can we shrink this disease and make it easier to, to, to and less morbid um, and do what's called neoadjuvant treatment? So when we think about that, the newer, the two newer drugs that have been FDA approved recently are um, RET inhibitors, namely selpercatinib and pralcetinib. Um, can you, other, Naifa, sorry to interrupt, can you briefly, um, in you know, 30 seconds, uh, I'll challenge you, mention you know, the FDA approved drugs and uh, for, for medullary thyroid cancer in the US. The, this obviously, this is a global conference, so this is gonna vary. And so what, what the new data is in, in, uh, on, with these drugs? Yeah, so um, for medullary thyroid cancer that is um, metastatic, not surgically resectable and progressive, um, then the, there are four FDA approved drugs in the United States for medullary thyroid cancer, namely uh, uh, vandetinib, cabozantinib, selpercatinib and pralcetinib. Um, and the, the first two are considered anti-VEGF or more um, um, anti-angiogenic therapies. And the, uh, the, la the latter two, silpercatinib and pralcetinib are RET inhibitors. Um, and they, the two RET inhibitors have recently been FDA approved for RET um, altered thyroid cancers. So RET mutated medullary thyroid cancer in this case, whether it's hereditary or sporadic. Um, and because um, they will not work, right, if you don't have a RET alteration. And so in this case, this patient has a RET mutation. And so you have all four choices um, for treatment, right? We know that the other two drugs also work if you have a RET mutation, um, but the, the, the RET inhibitors tend to have less antiangiogenic activity. So we tend to think of a patient like this who has a RET inhibitor where surgery is going to be difficult, where the initial management typically would be surgery because the distant disease is not threatening right now, whereas the neck disease is, is to try to give a drug, shrink the tumor, um, and then um, go forward with surgery and decide whether you want to continue it after surgery. So it, when we think about neoadjuvant drugs, we ideally want to use less anti-angiogenic uh, inhibition just because of wound healing um, and fistulas and, and things like that. So in this case, we'd have a discussion if Dr. Wong felt that it hates better, potentially because of the membrane um, issue that was brought up or other organs, we would use one of the RET inhibitors uh, first and um, and hopefully in a trial setting, right? Because this is not a proven technique, and um, and then uh, go forward with surgery. Let me pause for just a second. Two questions. One to Ramona. There's some questions in here, Ramona, about nuclear medicine imaging, dodo, F dopa, those sorts of things in medullary. And then I'll come to Maria. Maria, there's a lot of people on this call that don't have access to cabazant and nebaret. So how, if you were in a situation where you didn't you weren't in Houston with all of this sort of stuff, wherever you were, how would that color what you're doing? Ramona, nuclear medicine, and then Maria, if you don't have access. Yeah, with the newer nuclear medicine scans, like the DOTA test scan, um, my personal use of this, um, uh, these new technologies is to use them uh, in the setting of high calcitonin uh, levels and no evidence of structural disease on, on, on um, uh, other CT scans. For the preoperative assessment of medullary thyroid cancer, I don't usually rely on these scans. Good anatomical cross-sectional images are, are best in this setting. Uh, so yes, they, they have a, a good role in, in some patients, but not in this particular patient. I will not um, rely on these scans at this point. Maria? Okay, so the question is about if you don't have access to these newer drugs, I assume. 
then what would be the, the initial management? So the initial management, the standard of care is still surgery first, um, if it's operable, and then uh, addressing the systemic disease uh, depending on um, whether there's progression or not. So if the systemic, the distant disease is stable, then you don't need any systemic therapy um, up front. So we would wait um, after surgery and reassess the patient in you know three to six months in their distant disease. And then if they are progressing, then you can use um, in these drugs, whichever is available. I think most countries have have some type of you know anti-VEGF, uh, anti-RET uh, drugs available. And um, so you could use any of these. I would not use, um, I just want to mention that I would not use cabozantinib or vandetinib um, as neoadjuvant for a patient like this um, because of the very long half-life of these drugs um, and the antiangiogenic potential of them. So, um, so if you didn't have a selective RET inhibitor, which um, are, are probably safer in, in that um, preoperative, perioperative setting, then, um, then you, you should just use surgery as the initial management. So, Mark, it's not, we're going to be headed down probably a neoadjuvant approach. Uh, any concern that if you do a neoadjuvant approach and it doesn't work, um, you now lose the contralateral nerve? You've already got one nerve out. You know, the, we always assume if we're going to do neoadjuvant, it's going to work. What if it doesn't work? And you, while you're treating or waiting or trying to get the drug, you lose that other nerve. Any concern for that? Yeah, sure. I mean, there's always um, there's always concern for that. I think um, I think when we look at the data for these drugs, I mean, we see um, uh, you know the data that's been published in you know uh, both for both uh, selprocadinib and prosetinib. You see generally you know about sixty percent, even seventy percent efficacy by resist criteria. That's not uniform, but typically you do see response, and typically it's actually you know pretty 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 considerable response. So. Um, you would expect response rather than progression. I mean, I wouldn't worry so much about that the, the, the disease was going to progress on therapy and the nerve was going to go out before surgery. I would, you know, worry about uh, much more um, about the the surgery um, and and how the the you know obviously the the left nerve looks like it's already um, it's already out. So that nerve is unlikely to probably ever come back. You know, even if you have a great response to therapy, you're, you're unlikely to get that nerve to, to start functioning again, because that nerve has probably already been sort of killed, so to speak, by the by the tumor. Um, but on the right side, you know, you could potentially have a situation where that nerve is functioning, but um, but that it is stuck to the tumor um, so that um, uh, that that even like a temporary neuropraxia, for instance, you know, which can happen, you know, in, in you know, five to 10 percent of, of, of thyroid surgery, especially when you're dealing with a surgery where there's disease that's right in the tracheoesophageal groove on the side of an only functioning nerve. You have to worry you know, about that. And so I think when you're doing considering surgery for a patient like this, um, considering they also have distant disease, whether you know whether you use a neoadjuvant approach or not. And I, I, I do. The standard of care is, is surgery. The neoadjuvant approach is something that's that's being studied in clinical trials, but. But either way, when you're doing the surgery, you do have to be a bit conservative with the with the management of that nerve intraoperatively because um, because the patient has 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 distant disease from from what it looks like with the with the um, cross sectional uh, imaging and the calcitonin level, and so you're not going to cure this patient surgically anyway. So you do have to keep that in mind as you um, you don't want to to be overly aggressive and or and or radical with your surgery and you know, make the patient trach dependent and then, um, you know, and then understanding that you're not curing that patient anyway. Okay. Um, so as, as always, as always happens at tumor boards, we love to talk too much. Uh, so let's, let's tell us more of the story about this case. Uh, Cause we're about yeah. 24 minutes after let's go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to, we're going to move on. So, so this is what we decided to do in this case. We do have a clinical trial looking at this. We, we gave the patient neoadjuvant selvercatinib. We saw about a 40% resist response in the neck, both uh, tracheoesophageal grooves you know, as as we as we typically see with the RET specific inhibitors, you know, the calcitonin drops about 95, 98 percent. You see a huge drop in the calcitonin here, um, down to uh, down to 28. I just wanted to. Um, we only have a minute or two left on this presentation, but Maria, explain how that happens. Um, is that just that the disease is shrinking, or is there something else going on here in terms of that calcitonin shrinking? 
Yeah, the RET inhibitors can um, can inhibit calcitonin production, and so we look at both calcitonin and CEA to see, you know, as an as an adjunct to to uh, our CT scanning to see if the patient's responding. But we tend to um, really put more um, emphasis on the CEA in patients who are on selective RET inhibitors. Um, that you know, if the if the CEA is um, is going in the wrong direction, uh, then then we worry about that. Uh, this patient has both calcium and VA that have, have decreased, so so we feel good about this, and we have a CT scan that corroborates that. Great, thank you for that uh, explanation. So um, we did find um, that uh, that the left nerve was involved with tumor and had to be sacrificed during the surgery. Um, Jen, quickly, we only have about another minute for this case, but. But, but if you have to sacrifice a nerve like this um, um, during surgery, how do you manage that? Um, what are your considerations for a case like this? Yeah, so um, all three approaches that you have on the slide is um, my go-to. I, if I can, I would try a primary anastomosis first to mobilize the nerve, both proximally and distally, uh, and that would be the most preferred option. Um, if I cannot achieve that, then I would try to nerve graph it. Uh, typically, ANSA cervicalis uh, would be what I would use since it's already in the field. And then cases where that's not possible, uh, then I would uh, favor um, uh, uh, augmentation, and we typically here uh, would consider both injection uh, as well as uh, implant laryngoplasty, depending on patient's preference. Great. Um, so that's what we did in ANSA to um, to um, a distal nerve uh, stump, the, the stump right at the joint here, uh, anastomosis here uh, after sacrificing the nerve. So um, the patient did did fine with surgery. Um, you see his calcitonin dropped significantly, but after and then it dropped a little bit more with the surgery. After the surgery, he comes off the drug, and um, you see his calcitonin uh, bumped back up, and that's that's largely due to um, his uh, his the, the presence of residual distant disease. Um, and uh, uh, so that this is something where this patient um, likely will ultimately need to go back on um, some type of targeted therapy in the future uh, as well. So we do have a clinical trial looking at this neoadjuvant to self-recadinib approach. It's a multi-center trial. Um, and you can look up details on um, clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, um, so um, our next case, um, anaplastic thyroid cancer. Um, so we're going to just uh, uh, give you the uh, the diagnosis here. This is a 65-year-old gentleman, otherwise healthy. Um, he's got a classic case of you know rapidly progressive um, thyroid mass with hoarseness, um, difficulty swallowing, and you know when he's when he's starting to have some difficulty breathing when he lies flat at night is. You do a core biopsy and you get an anaplastic thyroid cancer. Um, uh, in this case, um, well, let's let's ask Maria. Um, what what are your um, so obviously this is a rapidly growing tumor. How do we approach this? Um, and you know, in, in terms of speed and the, what tests need to be done quickly, and, and just kind of walk us through that just briefly here. Yeah. So um, at MD Anderson, we've established this protocol where we can basically get everything done within a week, everything the patient needs initially. So what that week can, looks like is, you know, they get imaging of basically the whole body from um, brain down to pelvis, and then they also get a PET scan. Um, then uh, the patient is, if we don't have uh, the material that we need for BRAF staining, right, immunohistochemistry, um, then we obtain another biopsy. So in order to establish the diagnosis of BRAF mutated ATC, you need to obviously run some type of test. And the fastest way to do that is by, by staining the slide for BRAF. And so, but you need core material or you need a cell block. And oftentimes what we, what we get from the outside is, is an FNA. That's the typical, you know, nodule um, approach is to do an FNA. And so we can't use that material to stain it because you get false positive. So we would re-biopsy the patient in, in most cases and then quickly um, do the BRAF staining. We can, get, we can get the results in 24 hours. It depends on whether you have the antibody at your institution or not, um, whether you can get this very quickly or not. Um, but so Maria, why, it, and why, why are we focusing just on BRAF here? I mean, what, what, what is the significance? Yeah. How, how common is BRAF? Uh, mutation in, in anaplastic thyroid cancer, and, uh, and and why is it so significant to do that particular test? 
Yeah, so now, you know, if you look at the, the new ATA guidelines, um, the algorithm essentially starts with staging and BRAF. Um, you have to know what the BRAF uh, status is because uh, we now have very good treatments for BRAF mutated anaplastic thyroid cancer. And so um, everything starts with BRAF essentially. Uh, so if the patient does have a BRAF mutation, then you go down one pathway. And if they don't have a BRAF mutation, then, you know, kind of a more complicated situation. Um, so, so we, you know, about 40% of our patients have a BRAF mutation. So it's, it's pretty likely that you're going to encounter that. Most um, BRAF mutated anaplastic thyroid cancers also have a coexisting papillary thyroid cancer. So if you see that in a biopsy, um, then you can also, or the patient has a history of papillary thyroid cancer, more than likely, it's probably 90% chance that that patient has a BRAF mutation. So, um, so it is important to know what the BRAF status is up front. Great. Yeah, thank you. So this patient does have uh, the BRAF V600E. He also has uh, a PIK3CA and a TP53 mutation. Um, the PET scan, we see an image here of the PET scan in the neck, but let's just... Uh, just tell you that there's no definitive distant disease on the PET, and he's got some on the CT of the chest. He's got some non-specific subcellular lung, lung nodules. What's the significance of the um, the TP53 and the PIK3CA mutations, uh, Dr. Cabanillas? Yeah, so we uh, published on um, on the different mutations that we can encounter. I didn't mention one thing, which was that we also do a CF DNA on these patients. So we're looking for um, uh, tumor DNA in the blood, which is also a faster test than the gold standard of, of sending um, for full mutations and, and fusion. And so we looked at our patients who had CF DNA done and, um, and patients that had a PI3 kinase mutation, their, their, their survival was much shorter than patients that didn't, whether they had a BRAP or didn't have a BRAP in conjunction. So, so we think that these patients who have a coexisting PI3 kinase mutation probably have um, a more aggressive um, anaplastic thyroid cancer. The P53 mutations are very common. I think Memorial um, has, uh, has reported um, somewhere around 80%, if I'm not mistaken, uh, of P53 mutations. There's you know, no way, this is a tumor suppressor gene. Uh, there's no way to target this. But um, but this is a common uh, co-mutation with um, with other driver mutations in anaplastic thyroid cancer. Great, so thanks. Pretty Maria. much expected. Yeah. So um, so Jen, um, so we get some. Uh, so this is some more detailed uh, PET imaging, uh, as well as uh, uh, axial um, CT imaging. You know, what kinds of things do we see here uh, on the imaging? Yeah, so um, firstly, the you know, in the histories, uh, you know, the patient presented with shortness of breath. So uh, examining this area uh, on uh, imaging as well as by uh, flexible endoscopy would be very important to assess the airway um, and to ensure that the patient does not any uh, require any acute intervention. So here, both in the PET scan and the axial uh, CTs, uh, there is evidence of a laryngeal uh, uh, involvement potentially um, in the skin that's in the middle here. Um, the, the tumor appears to be infiltrating the right uh, paraglotic space. Uh, lower down, um, the cartilage is at least pushed in the trachea there. Um, it's not, uh, you know, I'd be very concerned about tracheal involvement there um, uh, given the imaging, but I would uh, want to look at the other cuts as well, uh, the other sections, uh, but I'd be concerned about uh, uh, laryngeal edema uh, as well as bilateral wolfram paralysis. Uh, Jen, so, you know, it looks like there's a little node that's pet avid here in the right lateral neck. You know, we, we know this patient has a vocal cord paralysis, um, uh, a, um, uh, a right-sided uh, vocal cord uh, paralysis here. So what is this? Is this a, like a tumor metastasis here, this little thing right here? The radiologist, yeah. you know, is, is calling this like a tumor metastasis in the, yeah. in the, in the, in the pharynx here. What, what, what is that? Yeah, so we see that actually quite often in our PED. Um, obviously, I will want to look at the other cuts, but uh, that most likely is uh, due to uh, overcompensation by the uh, contralateral cord. 
Yeah, exactly. So so you do see this quite commonly when you've got a vocal cord vocal fold paralysis on the contralateral side, you'll see increased uh, uh, pet activity in the posterior cricoarytenoid muscle, um, suggesting asymmetric asymm activity. This is not a uh, tumor. This is an artifact of having a vocal cord paralysis, paralysis on the contralateral side. So that's something that uh, a little radiology pearl there. So um, hold on a second. Hey, Maria, let me let me ask you sort of the big 30,000 foot question, because we, we always have like some very senior people that sit in the front row and say, what the heck are you guys doing? Uh, you know, you got a seven centimeter anaplastic cancer. I don't believe for a second he doesn't have distant meds. You, you just haven't found him yet. He's He's got to have some distant meds. Um, and, and I get this feel that you guys are about to do something to this guy. Um, if if we were five years ago, I would hide this guy from you, right? I mean, I would be saying, but by all means, don't see a medical oncologist. They might hurt you and maybe do some external beam radiation. Can you talk about sort of how you would have thought about this maybe five years ago versus sort of how we're thinking about it now, uh, which is different? So just reflect on that a little bit, Maria. Yeah, well, actually, you know, the guidelines still say that 4B uh, patients can have upfront radiation. So that's definitely still an option for this patient, even though he has a BRAF mutation. The, um, you know, things have changed in the past five years, because in 2018, the BRAF inhibitors were approved, uh, DeBRAF neutromentinib was approved for BRAF mutated ATC. Um, but, you know, you're right about, does this patient have any distant disease? Well, yeah, I mean, we think that, that all of these patients have at least microscopic disease, and the patient has nonspecific lung nodules. Only time is going to tell whether those are actually metastases or not. Um, but given the fact that we think all of these patients already have systemic disease, and within one year, 75% of patients are going, to, are going to fail their initial therapy, meaning they're either going to develop distant metastases if we didn't see them in the beginning, or they're going to progress through radiation. So because of that, we, we actually want to treat this like a systemic disease and not just focus on the neck. We know it's somewhere else. Uh, Ramona, I, I don't want to put you on the spot or anything, but um, are Mark and Maria out of control? I mean, we're just, we're, we're, we're just talking about, I mean, good Lord, look at this CT scan. I, uh, are we doing the right thing here, Ramona? Yeah, we are lucky to have the entire um, MD Anderson fast team on this call right now. Uh, but um, yeah, so the BRAF targeted therapy has truly revolutionized the, the treatment for these patients. And it's impressive how uh, um, deep the responses can be in these patients. So we see tumor melt within two to three days after starting BRAF targeted therapy. I have many patients who I met for the first time in the hospital. They couldn't breathe or eat anything by mouth. And we started this in an urgent manner on the hospital bed, send them home. And in two days, they call me back and say, doctor, I can eat sandwiches. So it is impressive how quickly and how deep the responses can be in the neck. And um, yeah, they are not out of control. We are all into this. <laughs> and we will definitely continue to, to offer these therapies for our patients. Yeah, I hate, I hate to admit it, but we agree with you guys. We had Mark up for our tumor board yesterday, and we showed one of these cases where they basically went away to nothing. So this is absolutely real. All right, Mark, keep going. So, Ramona, just continuing with you. Um, so, you know, the FDA-approved option, as Dr. Cabanillas mentioned, is the is the BRAF MEK inhibitor. Specifically in the U.S., it's the BRAF and Intramedinib. There are other combinations. But it, is that is that what we do um, for this patient? Do we do we add anything on to that? Um, do we consider... I mean, do we ever consider anything else other than a BRAF MEK inhibitor in a patient like this who's got a BRAF mutation, this first-line therapy? Yeah, so we have shown through some uh, translational work done here at MD Anderson that this tumor express really high levels of PD-L1, uh, and that can be targeted with immunotherapy. We're talking of PD-L1 scores of about more than 50% in more almost everybody. Uh, so with that in mind, we do consider using immunotherapy as, uh, as an additive uh, treatment to the BRAF targeted therapy. And uh, Dr. Cabanias is on the call right now, but uh, she's a PI of a trial we perform here using the triple BRAF, MEK, and immunotherapy regimens. And patients tolerate that very well, and they, um, they have potentially better, better outcomes. We don't know yet. Do you, Maria, so do as you a want to standard talk? at MD Anderson, we do use the triplet up front. Sorry, Ramona. Uh, 
great, uh, great insight there. Maria, do you want to talk just in 30 seconds about the result of that cohort A uh, uh, BRAF MEK inhibitor plus immunotherapy? I know you presented that recently at ASCO, and hopefully we'll see the paper soon, but you want to talk briefly about that? that? Yeah, so the, the trial is with different drugs. It's the Vemurap and Cobimetinib, Atezolizumab. That's the combination. Um, and and in that clinical trial, if you had a BRAF mutation, you could go on that triplet. Um, we did allow patients to have surgery if they had a, a very good response and they became a surgical candidate. And at the time that we last looked at our median overall survival, the median had not been met. And this trial has been open since, I think we enrolled our first patient in 2017. So we still have a lot of patients who are alive on that study. Um, and, and so we do think that the upfront triplet is probably better. Why? Because that if you, if we, um, if you look at real world data, and well, Jen can talk about this, debrafenib, trametinib, you know, patients do really well the first year and then they start to, and then they start to progress. Um, about uh, 12 months into therapy, and that's when you start to um, scratch your head and, and ask, well, what am I going to do now? Um, and so we think that adding the immunotherapy up front might keep them um, from progressing uh, so soon, um, but we don't know if that's the case. We obviously would need a, tr a trial comparing um, the, the doublet to the triplet to know that. So Maria, let me let me have you just make a comment about linvatinib. There was some excitement about that a few years ago that looked like it was effective, but I get the feel maybe not so much now. What what's the what's our current take on the linvatinib story? Yeah, so um, you know the initial report, um, the clinical trial in Japan, um, and and the results were very good. The median overall survival with single agent linvatinib was ten months. Uh, and, and so um, we were very excited about using linvatinib. We opened a trial in the United States. It actually closed early for futility. I think we had one patient who responded um, to single agent linvatinib. So we no longer use um, uh, single agent anything really at MD Anderson. Uh, we, we think this is um, you know, a disease that you could kind of compare to a, a leukemia, an acute leukemia, where you would never use one drug because the tumors can outsmart that drug very quickly, and, and they develop resistance. So we always use combination in, in anaplastic thyroid cancer. So um, uh, moving on with this case, great commentary and discussion. Um, we did, this patient uh, was uh, put on uh, a BRAF mech inhibitor and immunotherapy combination, had a, a, a rapid and dramatic response, as we can, um, we can see on the imaging. Still has a little bit of... Um, uh, a pet avid uh, residual disease there in the in the uh, low uh, neck. Um, in the interest of time, we're gonna uh, we're gonna kind of move on to to what we actually did here. We we actually um, as as was mentioned, um, the um, um, these patients with uh, with anaplastic thyroid cancer on BRF mech inhibitor um, often encounter resistance in the first year, and there's some some data that that. Um, that we published on that and some data that's soon to be published by Dr. Wong uh, is the lead author of that. And so we, we do look at um, adding other adjuvant treatment um, options. Uh, you know, Dr. Cabanillas and Dudu uh, mentioned the immunotherapy. Um, surgery is another option. We treat a lot of these patients neoadjuvantly where we, we give them the BRAF mech inhibitor immunotherapy combination for two to three months and then, uh, and then consolidate that treatment with surgery uh, plus or minus radiation therapy. Um, one could also consider a radiation uh, uh, approach and, and leave surgery out. We have not done that. Um, but these are things that we um, we're continuing to uh, to study in clinical trials. Um, so this particular patient, um, he refused the, the postoperative uh, chemo XRT, and we resumed the uh, tazovim Kobe postoperatively. Um, Dr. Dudu, can you talk about? So let's say. Let's say we do use a neoadjuvant approach uh, where we, we we put the patient on drug and then we consolidate that with surgery. Um, uh, this patient didn't have distant disease, um, uh, at least that we knew of up front, um, uh, uh, definitive distant disease. What are we going to do after surgery? Let's say we, you know, the, the the disease has been grossly removed per the surgeon uh, from the from the neck um, after neoadjuvant therapy. Um, are we going to just kind of observe that patient or what's our, what are our next steps? 
Yeah, as Maria mentioned before, there is about a 75% chance that this patient will um, fail uh, distantly in the next eight months. And knowing that this is a systemic disease that we mentioned, um, and in the face of him refusing even chemo XRT to, to complete the local control, I would favor continuing um, these drugs in the postoperative setting. Um, we, we know that this patient has systemic disease and it's just a matter of time for that to declare. So as, as, as early on we can treat this, the better off this patient outcome will be. So I will, I will say let's continue with the drugs. Yeah, so we yeah we counsel these patients, as Dr. Dadu mentioned up front, uh, about the sort of chronic nature of this disease, and these patients stay on this therapy um, indefinitely. So this this was a success. Not that all of our case, patients are this successful, but this particular patient's now four years out, um, and uh, his um, uh, uh, he's structurally without evidence of disease. So so um, again, they're not always this way, but we do have a clinical trial where we're um, we're looking at neoadjuvant dibrafenib, trametinib, pembrolizumab um, uh, for BRAF mutated anaplastic thyroid cancer. This is also on clinicaltrials.gov, and um, this is a multicenter study that we're going to be further studying this issue. Um, let, me ask, let, me ask, let me ask Maria yes. one more question, just for, for like the ones of us that don't do tons of this. Uh, we have to tell the patient kind of what's going to happen. So in the setting of no distant metastasis, okay, somebody you're going to take down the neoadjuvant pathway for anaplastic. Um, in general, what's that sequence look like? The, you know, you, when do you do dab tram surgery? What do you do with external beam radiation? When do they restart? Without the details, what's what's that big picture look like, Maria? Yeah, it's actually uh, it's actually quite complicated, right? Because you have to keep the patient on the at least the dibrafenib right up till surgery. So we don't discontinue the dibrafenib um, until basically when they take it the day before their surgery. Um, the trametinib we hold for about five days prior because it, it does have some anti-angiogenic potential, um, and uh, and so just to be safe, we we stop that five days before. But you know, what there, we've had situations where we've had to stop the the drugs before then, and um, and the outcomes haven't been good. So we really do need to then if delay surgery if the patient has to hold drugs, um, we should delay the surgery too. Um, and be sure that they're actually on dibrafenib when they go to surgery. After surgery, it's, you know, a more complicated algorithm um, that, you know, people can, can email us uh, if you want to know more details. I don't think we have time to go into the, the post-operative uh, situation. Yeah. So, and we but, also do pembrolizumab usually with this combination. We do it up front also before surgery, but if the patient isn't able to get it before surgery, we'll start it after. Right. So, so complicated, not undoable, but complicated and, and sort of thinking through it in terms of when do you go back on drug? Do we do external beam radiation? What's the setting? Was there a complete grocery section? So just, just to make it clear that this is like not something you want to try at home. This is multidisciplinary thinking about it. you got to know the operative findings, the path report and try to integrate this. And in. so you, you guys have done an amazing yeah. job and we're still trying to learn exactly how to do that and thinking about the various points where we should question do we need to do more? Do we need to do less? Yeah, so great I, points. Oh, go ahead, Nathan. So on the pathology, as you know, as Mike was bringing up, if you go back a slide on that pathology, all the pathology that was removed was not anaplastic, except for maybe I think it said a small node. And I just want to say that that's very common. Um, when you use the neoadjuvant approach, right, and you use these BRAF MEK inhibitors with or without immunotherapy, and the patient goes for surgery, and then postoperatively, sometimes you don't see any anaplastic. And we've had a couple of patients who've been treated this way. And when they come to us, the drugs were stopped because they were told that this wasn't anaplastic. It was a mistake, right? It's not a mistake. The patient had anaplastic thyroid cancer. But then when you're treated with the BRAF MEK inhibitor, sort of that anaplastic disappears, right? But it's going to come back. Right. So um, just I just want people to be careful when we see the final pathology post-op not to tell the patient they don't have anaplastic. Correct. That's an excellent point, uh, Dr. Pusedi. Um So um, our last case, and we have about 10 minutes left, uh, so we'll spend a little bit less time on this, but this is a differentiated thyroid cancer case, a more advanced differentiated. So it's a 56-year-old lady who had a total thyroidectomy, central and lateral neck section several months ago for a conventional papillary thyroid cancer and was referred to MD Anderson for consideration of postoperative radioactive iodine and or radiation therapy for 
residual um, unresectable disease. And this was the um, pathology report that we received. Um, basically, you know, we reviewed it um, uh, at MD Anderson as well, but it was conventional PTC. It was bilateral and in the isthmus. There wasn't a significant disease in the thyroid, although it was multifocal. The largest focus was 1.5 centimeters extending you know, focally to the to the uh, margin without muscle involvement, and there were four of 27 uh, metastatic lymph nodes um, in the specimen. So um, we get this um, um, CT scan of the patient uh, when the patient comes here. So I guess, um, Jen, talk about um, uh, in this situation. Um, why do we get a CT CT scan in this patient? Are we? I mean, are we worried about? Um, about the radioact about that uh, upsetting our uh, plan for radioactive iodine and um, um, and then talk a little bit about this disease that's here. Um, you know, does this does this automatically mean that the disease has has grown back quickly? Um, you know, what what types of things can we do to try to figure out you know the growth rate of this disease? It's not always possible, but but how do we approach this? Yeah. So. Um... Uh, just with the interest of time. So I'm just going to kind of cut right to the chase. Um, with our practice pattern, we tend to see a lot of these kind of uh, recurrent residual disease patterns. So in our practice, we use uh, CT neck with contrast uh, quite liberally, given that the risk of residual uh, disease is high in our patient population. So uh, our, uh, we get a CT neck here to look for evidence of residual disease. And uh, here in a patient who is uh, fresh post-op, uh, you know, here the disease looks to be residual disease to me uh, in the central neck uh, bilaterally, actually. And the other aspect of uh, what we look for is also sometimes we see, uh, so in addition to kind of um, residual disease, there's also a high incidence of undetected disease in the lateral neck, for example, that was not known previously. So the main utility here is to fully stage a patient to look for uh, any disease um, that may require additional surgery. Yeah, great, uh, Dr. Wong. Thank you for that. So, you know, the other thing that we also look at is what what was their previous imaging? You know, did they have, you know, sometimes it's a challenge because they don't have CT imaging before their initial surgery. Sometimes they just have an ultrasound. And there's always the challenges of comparing an ultrasound to a CT and it's a different test. Um, but in this case, this patient had CT imaging before surgery. So, you know, it's very important to go back and look at that. Um, so that we can sort of differentiate, you know, what 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 is this? Is this a is this an anaplastic cancer here that's uh, that's growing really fast and just came back, or is this um, is this just residual disease? And so so if there is uh, uh, initial imaging prior to to previous treatment, previous surgery, that's also important, which which we had in this case and demonstrated this to be relatively uh, stable, considerable disease in the central compartment um, uh, bilaterally, actually. Um, uh, uh, but actually stable disease. And this um, uh, and this is the uh, this is the PET imaging that was done after the initial surgery, which suggested that this is PET avid disease. Um, and we did the um, molecular testing on this patient, and um, the patient has a, a BRAP B600E mutation. So um, in summary, we've got a patient with stable residual bulky, um, low lateral superior uh, mediastinal uh, pet avid disease, no distant disease, and uh, the mutational testing is this BRAP B600E mutation. So, um, Ramona, talk about what our treatment options are here. We just had a case of this anaplastic thyroid cancer where we saw this, you know, dramatic response to this to this uh, BRAF MEK inhibitor. Um, would we just do the same thing here? Why not just do the same thing? Or aren't we going to see the same response here? Um, what are or what are our other options and considerations here? Yeah, so uh, unfortunately, in differentiated thyroid cancer, the responses to the uh, BRAF targeted therapy have not been uh, as impressive in terms of tumor shrinkage compared to anaplastic thyroid cancer. And uh, Dr. Busaili here on the call was part of the clinical trial that tried to investigate uh, single H and Dabrathony versus Dabrathony trametinib for differentiated thyroid cancer. And although the responses are, responses are good and sustained, um, the, the responses are not as, as deep in terms of uh, the amount of shrinkage that one could, could, could achieve uh, in, in, in this disease. 
So I think that um, in anaplastic thyroid cancer, it makes a lot of sense to use this in a new adjuvant approach for um, differentiated thyroid cancer. There is um, a, a really multidisciplinary evaluation with a, with a team, with a surgical team here, to see if, if this disease is truly resectable and we don't need to use upfront neoadjuvant uh, BRAF targeted therapy, I would favor to go the route of uh, using upfront surgery without the neoadjuvant approach if that can be achieved. Yeah, that's a great, uh, those are great points. So, so this patient, um, um, you know, is a surgeon and in the interest of time, we have five minutes. So, so we're going to, uh, we're going to move on a little bit, but um, you know, th this patient had had recent surgery, has bilateral central compartment disease, um, vocal cords are both moving, but um, we obviously don't want to go back into that surgical field immediately because there's so much inflammation and scar tissue there. So we need some kind of a strategy either just to actively surveil this for, for some months and let everything settle down before another surgery. We certainly don't want to pull the trigger on radiation here. Um, you know, that, that, would, um, that would preclude any further surgical options and be absolutely, um, could be absolutely disastrous for this patient. Um, and then, you know, obviously radioactive iodine is not gonna, is not gonna get rid of this, this type of bulky disease. So in this case, we did actually try this. And this, this has been a couple of years ago, you know, uh, that, that we had this case. We, we tried it, we tried the debrafenib to see, because we were gonna be watching this patient for, for some time anyway, before surgery, just to see what would happen. And, and as Ramona said, uh, Ramona stated in the study that, that Maria has done, um, we see a very minimal to you know modest response. The responses are typically stable disease, and that's what we saw here after six months of debrafenib um, for this particular patient. And then we do the surgery. Um, uh, fortunately, her surgery went well. We were able to get the uh, bilateral central uh, bulky disease out of there. And the last point in the last few minutes. Um, so um, we do a uh, we do a radioactive uh, uptake scan and. Um, um, there's, um, there's minimal activity. Um, Maria, can you talk about, um, uh, a radioactive iodine, uh, in a patient like this and, and what your considerations are and, and how you evaluate it and, and, and how you do the dosing for a patient like this? Yeah. So, um, so this is, uh, a patient who has a BRAF mutation unlikely to take up radioiodine. And so, you know, that, um, and, and then you have the PET scan also that shows a lot of uptake. So at Memorial Sloan Kettering, they actually use that FDG uh, uptake, the FDG avidity, to um, define some patients that have radioiodine refractory disease. So in this patient, um, I don't know at Memorial Sloan Kettering, but we, you know, at, at MD Anderson, we might do a, a whole body scan just to show that there's no uptake. Um, but we wouldn't treat this patient with this diagnostic whole body scan, knowing what we know in this patient. However, you know, we can uh, try and use um, redifferentiation therapy. Um, and, um, you know, not, I, I, not that this patient um, necessarily would undergo redifferentiation therapy up front, um, but it is an option, especially in patients who have some distant disease that you'd like to target with radioiodine. Great, great uh, points. Well, that, uh, Dr. Tuttle, I'm going to, um, in the interest of time, I'm going to turn it back over to you. We have uh, one to two minutes left. I don't know if there's a last minute question that you have or a question from the audience. Those were three cases that we wanted to present, ATC, MTC, and an aggressive DTC. And uh, we'll, we'll take any questions from you or, or the audience. Thank you, Mark. We're, we'll wind down here. The, it was phenomenal. This was our first having another institution do the tumor board, and you guys did great as always. It's really insightful to see how you listen to each other and talk to each other and how jointly, because no, no one of us can take care of any of these patients. These are complicated patients. And uh, I and congratulate you guys for really leading the way on this neoadjuvant story and on the anaplastic story. We're all sort of following that and doing our best to try to get ahead of you unsuccessfully at this point, but we're, we're doing our best. So let me just say thank you to all of you for the panelists. Thanks to Mark for putting the cases and stuff together. Thanks for the questions from the audience, and we'll wish everybody a wonderful day. Uh, and thanks again, team. Have a good day. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thank you.